What if you could view the world from a new perspective? Explore the line between truth and fiction. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Illumination Hour. It's 2017 and I have got a fancy new intro. I hope you all like it. The song I chose is called Space Cadet from the album 3D Pinball from Sir Jordanius. And I'm going to play the entire song at the end of this show. But it's really fun, and I enjoy it. And I wanted to give credit to the person who created it because, you know, that's the nice thing to do. Because I downloaded the song for free. It wasn't like I paid Sir Jordanius to use his music. But I really enjoy it, and I hope the rest of you do as well. So we're starting off this new year talking about an exciting and kind of obscure subject. Uh, It's something I've been reading about lately, and I've always kind of known that it was there in the background of mathematics. There's this weird thing called chaos theory, and it's hinted at in a lot of the basic principles that you learn about studying chemistry or physics, but it's never plainly explained in those topics because it is by itself an entirely different and new branch of study. It took me a long time to wrap my mind around what chaos theory really means. And it wasn't until I started reading more into it, I actually started reading a book about it. It's titled Chaos by James Gleick. And it does a great job at telling the story of the mathematicians that begin studying chaos theory. And like most things in science... It wasn't as if they knew what they were looking for and they went out in search of it. Chaos theory was stumbled upon by accident. So, what exactly is it? I keep making references to it. I haven't explained it fully yet. Do not worry. Here comes the explanation. I have this great article from fractalfoundation.org describing exactly that. Chaos is the science of surprises. Of the non-linear, or the unpredictable. It teaches us to expect the unexpected. While most traditional science deals with supposedly predictable phenomena like gravity, electricity, or chemical reactions, chaos theory deals with non-linear things that are effectively impossible to predict or to control, like turbulence, weather, the stock market, our brain states, or our hearts, and so on. These phenomena are often described by fractal mathematics, which captures the infinite complexity of nature. Many natural objects exhibit fractal properties, including landscapes, clouds, trees, organs, rivers, and many of the systems in which we live exhibit complex, chaotic behavior. Recognizing the chaotic, fractal nature of our world can give us new insight, power, and wisdom. For example, by understanding the complex, chaotic dynamics of the atmosphere, a balloon pilot can steer a balloon to a desired location. By understanding that our ecosystems, our social systems, and our economic systems are interconnected, we can hope to avoid actions which may end up being detrimental to our long-term well-being. So chaos theory is essentially a way of explaining the unexplained, unpredicted phenomena that we see in the natural world. It's a way to account for unpredictable behavior. There are a few essential principles of chaos that we can talk about to help us explain this idea. First off, The butterfly effect, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. This effect grants the power to cause a hurricane in China to a butterfly flapping its wings in New Mexico. It may take a very long time, but we could make this connection. 
If that butterfly had not flapped its wings at just the right point in space and time, moving the right molecules of air in the right direction, the hurricane would not have happened. A more rigorous way to express this is that small changes in the initial conditions lead to drastic changes in the results. Our lives are an ongoing demonstration of this principle. Who knows what the long-term effects of teaching millions of kids about chaos and fractals will be? Another one of the essential principles of chaos is its unpredictability. Because we can never know all the initial conditions of a complex system in sufficient or perfect detail, we can't hope to predict the ultimate fate of a complex system. Even slight errors in measuring the state of a system would be amplified dramatically, rendering any prediction useless. Since it is important to measure the effects of all the butterflies in the world, accurate long-range weather predictions will always remain impossible. Here I think the butterfly effect can kind of be used as a metaphor for all of those little things which affect changes on the situation. Maybe it isn't a butterfly flapping its wings that causes a hurricane. Maybe it's a splash in the ocean somewhere. Or maybe it's a flock of birds changing direction. We don't exactly know, and we never can know, because there are just too many factors. Hence the idea of unpredictability and chaos. But one important distinction to keep in mind is that Orderly or disorderly chaos is not simply disorder. Chaos explores the transitions between order and disorder, which often occur in surprising ways. Something else that happens in chaotic systems is mixing. Turbulence ensures that two adjacent points in a complex system will eventually end up in very different positions after some time has elapsed. For example, Two neighboring water molecules may end up in different parts of the ocean or even in different oceans. A group of helium balloons that launch together will eventually land in drastically different places. This was exemplified in 1992 when 28,000 rubber duckies were lost at sea. This is no joke. I have a story here from MNN.com. Describing how, in 1992, a shipping crate containing 28,000 plastic bath toys was lost at sea when it fell overboard on its way from Hong Kong to the United States. No one at the time could have guessed that those same bath toys would still be floating the world's oceans nearly 20 years later. Since that fabled day in 1992, when they were unceremoniously abandoned at sea, the yellow ducks bobbed halfway around the world. Some have washed up on the shores of Hawaii, Alaska, South America, Australia, and the Pacific Northwest. Others have been found frozen in Arctic ice. Still others have somehow made their way as far as Scotland and Newfoundland in the Atlantic. So I'm not going to read the rest of the article, but that captures the essence of chaos, at least in the oceanic system. We can somewhat predict the direction of the currents of the ocean, but there's no way for us to predict how or why all of those little rubber duckies that were released from the same spot ended up in completely different areas thousands of miles apart all across the world. The next principle of chaos is feedback, which is present more or less in every system. Because, of course, in our natural world that we exist in, all systems are related, or they give feedback and receive feedback. The weather system, the natural life cycle of animal species, our market system, they're all connected and they all give feedback. Systems often become chaotic when there is feedback present. A good example is the behavior of the stock market. As the value of a stock rises or falls, people are inclined to buy or sell that stock. 
This in turn further affects the price of the stock, causing it to rise or fall chaotically. In essence, there is no way to accurately predict what the market price of a certain stock is going to be from minute to minute. Earlier when I was reading, I mentioned that chaos can be modeled with fractal mathematics. So here I feel that I should describe what fractals are. A fractal is a never-ending pattern. They are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. So when you look at a fractal, it looks like a cool-looking pattern. You know, and if you zoom in on one spot of the fractal, it's going to look exactly the same on that smaller scale as it did on the larger scale. And if you zoom in even more, you can see the pattern repeating itself again and again into infinity. These fractals are created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop. Driven by recursion, Fractals are images of dynamic systems, the pictures of chaos. Geometrically, they exist in between our familiar dimensions. Fractal patterns are extremely familiar since nature is full of fractals. For instance, the branches and leaves on trees, rivers as they branch out into their deltas, coastlines with their fjords and bays, Mountains, clouds, seashells, and hurricanes. These are all examples of fractals. And again, fractals are representations of chaos in mathematics. And they are represented graphically and sometimes are even made into cool artwork or used to design landscapes and movies. So it's just really interesting kind of stuff. So what I've just described is the basics of chaos theory and the principles that go along with it. But let's get more into depth and start describing more what chaos theory is and how it came about. Who could have come up with such an insane idea as the lack of predictability in a mechanical universe, which seemed to have been defined so well by people like Isaac Newton? who described the three basic laws of motion. This next article is from aberrimpublications.com. Remember Jurassic Park? Handsome mathematician Dr. Malcolm explaining to pretty Dr. Sattler why he thought it was unwise to have T-Rexes and the likes romping around on an island? John Hammond, the annoying owner, promised that Nothing could go wrong, and that all precautions were taken to ensure the safety of the visitors. Dr. Malcolm did not agree. Life finds a way, he said. Nature is highly complex, and the only prediction you can make is that she is unpredictable. The amazing unpredictability of nature is what chaos theory looks at. Why? Because Instead of being boring and translucent, nature is marvelous and mysterious. And chaos theory has managed to somewhat capture the beauty of the unpredictable and display it in the most awesome patterns. Nature, when looked upon with the right kind of eyes, presents herself as one of the most fabulous works of art ever wrought. Chaos theory is a mathematical subdiscipline that studies complex systems. Examples of these complex systems that chaos theory helped fathom are Earth's weather systems, the behavior of water boiling on a stove, migratory patterns of birds, or the spread of vegetation across a continent. Chaos is everywhere, from nature's most intimate considerations to art of any kind. Chaos-based graphics show up all the time, wherever flocks of little spaceships sweep across the movie screen in highly complex ways, or awesome landscapes adorn the theater of some dramatic Oscar scene. Complex systems are systems that contain so much motion, or so many elements that move, that computers are required to calculate all of the various possibilities. 
That is why chaos theory could not have emerged before the second half of the 20th century. But there is another reason that chaos theory was born so recently, and that is the quantum mechanical revolution and how it ended the deterministic era. Up to the quantum mechanical revolution, people believed that things were directly caused by other things, that what went up had to come down, and that if only we could catch and tag every particle in the universe, we could predict events from then on. Cause, effect, cause, effect, direct relationships. Entire governments and systems of belief were, and sadly are still, founded on these beliefs. And when Sigmund Freud invented psychoanalysis, he headed out from the idea that malfunctions in the mind are the results of traumas suffered in the past. Regression would allow the patient to stroll down memory lane, pinpoint the sore spot, and rub it away with Freud's healing techniques that were, again, based on linear cause and effect. Chaos theory, however, taught us that nature most often works in patterns, which are caused by the sum of many tiny pulses. It all started to dawn on people when in 1960, a man named Edward Lorenz created a weather model on his computer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Lorenz's array consisted of 12 equations that were nonlinear, that kicked around numbers endlessly. Clouds rose and winds blew. Heat scorched or cold came creeping up the breaches. Colleagues and students marveled over the machine because it never seemed to repeat a sequence. It was really quite like the real weather. Some even hoped that Lorentz had built the ultimate weather predictor, and if the input parameters were chosen identical to those of the real weather howling outside the McLaren building, it could mimic Earth's atmosphere and be turned into a precise prophet. But then one day, Lorenz decided to cheat a little bit. A while earlier, he had let the program run on certain parameters to generate a specific weather pattern, and he wanted to take a better look at the outcome. But instead of letting the program run from the initial settings and calculate the outcome, Lorenz decided to start halfway down the sequence by inputting the values that the computer had come up with during the earlier run. The computer that Lorenz was working with calculated the various parameters with an accuracy of six decimals. But the printout gave these numbers with a three decimal accuracy. So, instead of inputting certain numbers like wind, temperature, and other criteria as accurate as the computer had them, Lorentz settled for the three decimal place approximations. 5.123456 became 5.123. And that puny little inaccuracy appeared to amplify and cause the entire system to swing out of whack. Exactly how important is all this? Well, in the case of weather systems, it is very important. Weather is the total behavior of all the molecules that make up Earth's atmosphere. And according to the uncertainty principle, we've established that tiny particles cannot be accurately pinpointed. And this is the sole reason why weather forecasts begin to be bogus around a day or two into the future. We can't get an accurate fix on the present situation, just a mere approximation. And so our ideas about the weather are doomed to fall into misalignment in a matter of hours, and completely into the nebulas of fantasy within days. Nature will not let herself be predicted. So, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, or the Uncertainty Principle as it's sometimes called, is basically a principle that states the more precisely the position is determined, the less precisely the momentum is known in this instant, and vice versa. 
This is a succinct statement of the uncertainty relation between the position and the momentum, which is the mass times velocity of a subatomic particle, such as an electron. This relation has profound implications for such fundamental notions as causality and the determination of the future behavior of an atomic particle. So, this statement of uncertainty is basically saying that if you try to determine the position of a particle, you have to affect it in some way in order to sense where it is. And that's going to change its momentum. By the same token, if you're trying to measure the direction and speed that a particle is traveling, you will change its position. Therefore, there's no way to accurately predict what the future of that particle will be. Therefore, the initial situation of a complex system cannot be accurately determined, and the evolution of a complex system can therefore not be accurately predicted because this uncertainty principle prohibits precise answers. Complex systems often appear too chaotic to recognize a pattern with the naked eye. But by using certain techniques, large arrays of parameters may be abbreviated into one point in a graph. In a little rain or sunshine graph, every point represents a complete condition with wind speed, rainfall, air temperature, etc. But by processing these numbers in a certain way, they can be represented by one point. Stacking moment upon moment reveals the little graph and offers us some insight into the development of a weather system. The first chaos theorists began to discover that complex systems often seem to run through some kind of cycle, even though situations are rarely exactly duplicated or repeated. Plotting many systems in simple graphs reveal that often there seems to be some kind of situation that the system tries to achieve, an equilibrium of some sort. For instance, imagine a city of 10,000 people. In order to accommodate these people, the city will spawn one supermarket, two swimming pools, a library, and three churches. And for argument's sake, we'll assume that this setup pleases everybody and that equilibrium is achieved. But then, the Ben and Jerry's company decides to open an ice cream plant on the outskirts of town, opening jobs for 10,000 more people. The town expands rapidly to accommodate 20,000 people. Another supermarket is added, two swimming pools, one library, and three churches, and the equilibrium is maintained. That equilibrium is called an attractor. In other words, it attracts the data points towards this equilibrium. Now, imagine that instead of adding 10,000 people to the original 10,000, 3,000 people move away from the city, so only 7,000 remain. The bosses of the supermarket chain calculate that a supermarket can only exist when it has 8,000 regular customers. So after a while, they shut down the stores, and the people of the city are left without groceries. Demand rises, and some other company decides to build a supermarket, hoping that a new supermarket will attract new people. And it does, but many were already in the process of moving, and a supermarket will not change their plans. The company keeps the store running for a year and then comes to the conclusion that there just aren't enough customers and shut it down again. People move away. Demands rise. Someone else opens a supermarket. People move in, but not enough. Stores close again. And so on. This awful situation is also some kind of equilibrium, but a dynamic one. A dynamic kind of equilibrium is called a strange attractor. The difference between an attractor and a strange attractor is that an attractor represents a state to which a system finally settles, while a strange attractor represents 
some kind of trajectory upon which a system runs from situation to situation without ever settling down. The discovery of attractors was exciting and explained a lot, but the most awesome phenomena chaos theory discovered was a crazy little thing called self-similarity. Unveiling self-similarity allowed people a glimpse of the magical mechanism that shape our world, and perhaps even ourselves. Think about this. A snowflake is an object composed of water molecules. These molecules do not have a common nerve system, DNA, or a chief molecule that calls the shots. How do these molecules know where to go and hang out in order for a six-pointed star to form? And where do they get the audacity to form a different one every time? How does one molecule in the leg of the snowflake know which private design the rest of the gang is cruising for in other legs of the flake for the tiny molecule a million miles away? So how does nature direct molecules in snowflakes or crystals or any other regular form? Chaos theory has the answer. Self-similarity. A fundamental principle that allows building blocks to mimic their own shape in the building that they make. Consider this. A large number of particles will display a pattern that is near equal to the initial possibilities of a single particle. A similar thing is going on here. A large number of elements may form a shape that is derived from the shape of one element. And because no element can be coerced to follow a certain path, no large number of elements will display the exact same pattern as another group. Patterns caused by large numbers of elements are alike, but never the same. Hence, all snowflakes look alike, but no two are exactly identical. Self-similarity is a really big deal. It occurs all over nature, and many have argued that self-similarity is one of the key natural principles that shape our world the way it is. Self-similarity has been observed in all fields of research, physics, biology, and even psychology and sociology. An image that displays self-similarity is usually called a fractal, you know those never-ending patterns that we described earlier? One of the first works of fractal art was made in 1904 by a Swedish mathematician named Helg von Koch, and his piece was the so-called Koch Snowflake. He took a triangle and added a similar but smaller triangle to each of the sides of the first one. Then he added smaller triangles to the sides of the second ones, and again to the sides of the third ones and so on at infinitum. Every textbook reporting on Cuck's snowflake will demand that if indeed we continue this process at infinitum, we will add length to the outline at infinitum, hence producing an infinitely long line. And yes, theoretically, this is true. But with every step, the added triangle gets smaller and smaller, and in the real world, there is no such thing as infinitely small. After a great many steps, the sides of the smallest triangle will be one quantum long, and no smaller triangle can be added. And this is more important than it seems. The big difference between God's snowflake and Cock's snowflake is that God's are all different, while Cock's are all the same. Cock's snowflake is sterile, while God's snowflakes... Variety makes all the difference. This is why no two trees are the same, no two mountains are the same, and no two humans are the same. But there's more. Cuck's tiniest triangles are identical to the big triangle, but way down the line, this concoction proves to be an impossible structure. It's an unfractal since the tiniest triangles will lose their form and fuzz up. A sleek triangle like that will only occur in the minds of Cuck and perhaps Plato, but not in nature. Nature produces snowflakes that are never the same because the large-scale phenomena does not mimic the shape of the small-scale phenomena, but the behavior. Unpredictability, randomness, 
and sovereignty. And math has no way of generating randomness. Generating random numbers is somewhat of a sport among mathematicians, because how does one program randomness? There's no way, and so they cheat. They take some kind of infinite number series, like the number pi or e, and tell a computer to select decimals at certain intervals, like every fourth digit or seventh. Pi is a number without inner structure, and its digits are random. For as far as we know, so out comes a random number sequence. But this is not real randomness because any other smart computer could analyze the results and blow the whistle. This is not random randomness. This is pi randomness. And as the secret is out, the rest of the pseudo random sequences can be predicted. If the second computer divides every outcome of the first by the way it generates the pseudo-random sequence, it would spew out one every cycle. That violates the prime definition of randomness, and the sequence is not random. True randomness cannot be divided by something other than itself. And besides that, the decimals of the number pi go on forever. That means if we try to express the relationship between diameter and circumference of a circle, in the numbers we need infinite detail to stay truthful. But infinite detail does not exist. There's always a cutoff point, and so we must yield to the rather shocking conclusion that the before mentioned relationship cannot be expressed in numbers, and that pi is not a number at all. The same goes for that other famous number, e, and all so-called transcendental numbers, or numbers that go on forever after the dot, irrational numbers, numbers that represent infinite detail, and to make matters worse, transcendental numbers outnumber real numbers with an infinite factor. It may seem a bit paradoxical, but since mathematics cannot release its detailed accuracy. It loses connection with the real world around quantum level. So, to sum up what we've just discussed, self-similarity is a structure repeated on a different level of complexity, or at a different scale, such as a fractal. Another important thing to take away from what we've just discussed is that numbers cannot fully represent reality because they are too accurate. And they can't mimic the randomness that comes from the freedom, which is the most fundamental principle of nature. Since reality is fuzzy, accuracy is approximation. Or to put it in the words of Albert Einstein, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. It's amazing and weird at the same time, but chaos theory is the study of the weird and strange behavior that cannot be explained. It's the study of complex systems that, at first glance, appear to follow no orderly laws of mathematics or science. It's one of the most fascinating and promising developments of the late twentieth-century mathematics and science. It provides a way of making sense out of phenomena such as weather patterns that seem to be totally without organization or order. Scientists have traditionally had a rather strict cause and effect view of the natural world. English physicist Isaac Newton once said that if he could know the position and motion of every particle in the universe at any one moment, he could predict the future of the universe into the infinite future. He believed that all of those particles followed strict physical laws. Since he knew, or thought he knew, what these laws were, all he had to do was apply them to the particles at any one point in time. On the other hand, scientists have always realized that some events in nature appear to be just too complex to analyze. One of the best examples is weather patterns, 
we keep bringing it up because it is the best example. Even though scientists know a great deal about the elements that make up weather, they have a very difficult time predicting what the weather patterns will be. The term chaos has often been used to describe systems that are just too messy to understand by scientific analysis. The rise of modern chaos theory is not only owed to Lorenz. It can also be traced back to a couple of other few particularly striking and interesting discoveries. One of these events occurred in the 1890s when French mathematician Henri Poincaré was working on the problem of the interactions of three planets with one another. This problem should have been fairly straightforward, Poincaré thought, since the gravitational laws involved were well known. The results of his calculation were so unexpected, however, that he gave up his work. He described those results as so bizarre that I cannot bear to contemplate them. Dutch engineer B. van der Poel encountered a similar problem in working with electrical circuits. He started out with systems that could easily be described by well-known mathematical equations, but the circuits he actually produced gave off unexpected and irregular noises for which he could not account. Scientists and mathematicians now view chaotic behavior in a different way. Instead of believing that such behavior is too complex to ever understand, they have come to conclude that certain patterns exist within chaos that can be discovered and analyzed. For example, certain characteristics of a system appear to be able to generate chaotic behavior. Such characteristics are known as generators because they cause the chaotic behavior. Very small differences in a generator can lead to very large differences in a system at a later point in time. This can be described as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Researchers have also found that chaotic behavior sometimes has a tendency to settle down to some form of predictable behavior. When this happens, elements within the system appear to bring various aspects of the chaos together in a more understandable pattern. These elements are given the name attractors because they appear to attract the parts of a chaotic system to themselves. Let's talk more about attractors, specifically strange attractors. So, when Lorenz created his 12 nonlinear differential equations that modeled weather on his McB computer in 1961 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he decided to look for complex behavior in an even simpler set of equations, and was led to the phenomenon of rolling fluid convection. The physical model is simple. Place a gas in a solid rectangular box with a heat source on the bottom. Lorenz simplified a few fluid dynamic equations, called the Navier-Stokes equations, and ended up with a set of three nonlinear equations. So, a particular kind of fluid motion was what inspired Lorenz to create these three equations. The rising of hot gas or liquid, which is known as convection. In the atmosphere, convection stirs air heated by the sun-baked earth, and shimmering convection waves rise ghost-like above hot tar and radiators. Lorenz was just as happy talking about convection in a cup of hot coffee. As he put it, this was just one of the innumerable hydrodynamic processes in our universe whose future behavior we might wish to predict. How can we calculate how quickly a cup of coffee will cool? Well, if the coffee is just warm, the heat will dissipate without any hydrodynamic motion at all. The coffee remains in a steady state. But if it's hot enough, a convection overturning will bring hot coffee from the bottom of the cup up to the cooler surface. Convection in the coffee becomes plainly visible when a little cream is dabbled into the cup. The swirls can be complicated, but the long-term density of such a system is obvious. Because the heat dissipates and because friction slows a moving fluid, 
the motion must come to an inevitable stop. As Lorenz explained it, we might have trouble forecasting the temperature of the coffee one minute in advance, but we should have little difficulty in forecasting it an hour ahead. The equations of motion that govern a cooling cup of coffee must reflect the system's density. They must be dissipative. Temperature must head for the temperature of the room, and velocity must head for zero. On the surface, these three equations seem simple enough to solve. However, they represent an extremely complicated dynamic system. So let's talk about this example for a minute. A rolling fluid or gas that is inside of a rectangular box. When the liquid or gas is heated from below, the fluid tends to organize itself into cylindrical rolls. So, as we all know, in convection, the heated fluid rises to the top while the colder, denser fluid sinks to the bottom. So, here we have a system where the heat is affecting the cold and the cold is affecting the heat and the fluid is moving around in a circle. Hot fluid rises on one side, loses heat, and descends to the other side, the process of convection. But when the heat is turned up further, an instability sets in, and the rolls develop into a wobble that move back and forth along the length of the cylinders. At even higher temperatures, the flow becomes wild and turbulent. So as we increase the energy of this system, the turbulence and unpredictability increases. If we want to model this behavior, we can plot the positions of the water molecules on the three-dimensional XYZ plane with respect to time. If one plots the results in three dimensions, there is a figure called the Lorenz attractor which is obtained. Viewing this Lorenz attractor on the XZ plane, we can see that it creates two orbits that seem to be at a 90 degree angle from each other. They really seem to present you with the image of a butterfly flapping its wings, which is sort of ironic if you think about how the butterfly effect could amplify the differences between the pathways that the data set will follow. The Lorenz attractor is an example of a strange attractor. Strange attractors are unique from other phase space attractors in that one does not know exactly where on the attractor the system will be. Two points on the attractor that are near to each other at one time will be arbitrarily far apart at later times. The only restriction is that the state of the system remains on the attractor. Strange attractors are also unique in that they never close on themselves. The motion of the system never repeats, or it's non-periodic. The motion we're describing in these strange attractors is what we mean by chaotic behavior. The Lorenz attractor was the first strange attractor, but there are many systems of equations that give rise to chaotic dynamics. Examples of other strange attractors include the Rosler and Hennen attractors. The Rosler attractor arose from studying oscillations in chemical reactions. It is formed from another set of Navier-Stokes equations. Another strange attractor created recursively is the Hennen attractor. And if you look up these images, you'll see they are quite strange shapes indeed, in that they do form a sort of repetitive pattern, but the pattern is never exactly repeated. So, I know a lot of this might sound a little bit dry or confusing, but basically what I'm trying to say is that in nature, there is the possibility for total, complete randomness. As I mentioned earlier, humans and their inventions, such as computers, don't have the capability to be totally random. In all honesty, there are predictable patterns that each of us and our computers follow, when it comes to generating a number sequence. But in nature, there are no predictable patterns when you're looking at smaller scales. Overall, when you look at systems as a whole, it is easy to predict what's going to happen. 
when you're watching traffic from the view of a helicopter, it's clear to see that all of the traffic is still moving along the highway. Some cars are getting off of the exit, some are entering on, but it's a smooth, steady flow overall. If you happen to be inside of one of the vehicles on the road, it may seem highly chaotic. Cars are cutting you off and braking at the wrong moments, and then stepping on their gas and zooming off, and you have to catch up before the other cars pull in front of you. So, it's chaotic on smaller scales, but in larger scales, it looks smooth. And that's kind of what these attractors are representing. If you look at the graph overall, it looks like a smooth curvature of spirals or some repeated pattern. But close up, the points are far away and never repeated. While the points themselves on these attractors are never repeated exactly, the entire graph itself is self-similar. These are, in fact, images of fractals. So let's go back to fractals for a minute because I am just so fascinated by the idea of fractals. And actually, I'm going to present you with a theory that is completely mind-blowing, especially if you're a math nerd like me. So, let's start. This is from blog.worldmysteries.com. An introduction to fractals. A fractal has been defined as a rough or fragmented geometric shape that can be split into parts, each of which is at least approximately a reduced size copy of the whole a property called self-similarity. Roots of the idea of fractals go back to the 17th century, while many mathematically rigorous treatment of fractals can be traced back to functions studied by Karl Weierstrass, George Cantor, and Felix Hausdorff. A century later, in the studying functions that were continuous but not differentiable, However, the term fractal was coined by Benoit Mendelbrot in 1975 and was derived from the Latin fractus, meaning broken or fractured. A mathematical fractal is based on an equation that undergoes iteration, a form of feedback based on recursion, which is basically just the repetition of an equation again and again. There are several examples of fractals which are defined as portraying exact self-similarity, quasi-self-similarity, or statistical self-similarity. The Mandelbrot set is a famous example of a fractal. And I'm sure most of you have seen this before. The Mandelbrot set looks like a sort of heart shape. These are called cardioids in mathematics, with a smaller circle on the bottom end and then another smaller circle attached to that. But all around the edges, there are smaller and smaller circles. Anyway, while fractals are a mathematical construct, they are found in nature, which has led to their inclusion in artwork. They're useful in medicine, soil mechanics, seismology, and technical analysis. Approximate fractals are easily found in nature, these objects display self-similar structure over an extended but finite scale range. For example, ferns and trees are fractals in nature and can be modeled on a computer by using a recursive algorithm. The recursive nature is obvious since a branch from a tree or a frond from a fern are miniature replicas of the whole. Not identical, but similar in nature. The connection between fractals and leaves is currently being used to determine how much carbon is contained in trees. Some examples of natural objects that are approximated by fractals to a degree include clouds, rivers, fault lines, mountain ranges, craters, snowflakes, crystals, lightning, cauliflower and broccoli, ferns and trees, animal coloration patterns, systems of blood vessels and pulmonary vessels, ocean waves, DNA, and heartbeat. Even coastlines may be loosely considered fractal in nature. In 1999, 
certain self-similar fractal shapes were shown to have a property of frequency invariance, the same electromagnetic properties no matter what the frequency, from Maxwell's equations. A fractal often has the following features. It has a fine structure at arbitrarily small scales. It is too irregular to be easily described in traditional Euclidean geometric language. It is self-similar, at least approximately or stochastically. It has a Hausdorff dimension which is greater than its topological dimension, although this requirement is not met by space-filling curves such as the Hilbert curve. It also has a simple and recursive definition. Because they appear similar at all levels of magnification, fractals are often considered to be infinitely complex in informal terms. However, not all self-similar objects are fractals. For example, the real line, which is a straight Euclidean line, is formally self-similar but fails to have other fractal characteristics. For instance, it's regular enough to be described in Euclidean terms. Images of fractals can be created using fractal-generating software. Images produced by such software are normally referred to as being fractals, even if they don't have the above characteristics, such as when it's possible to zoom into a region of the fractal that doesn't exhibit any fractal properties. Also, these may include calculation or display artifacts, which are not characteristics of true fractals. One of the main properties of these structures is, again, self-similarity, which, when beginning from a detail, by further magnification, after a certain number of steps, one comes to the same or very, very similar detail. In the mid-70s of the 20th century, thanks to the possibility offered by the strongly expanding computer technique, a new mathematical discipline was established. The theory of chaos, which encompassed with its application the phenomena in physics, chemistry, meteorology, and even biology. One of the basic notions of this theory is fractal. Fractals were introduced by an American mathematician, a Jew immigrant from Poland, Benoit Mandelbrot, who defined them as a geometrical object showing a structure rich in detail, regardless of how much the structure is magnified. In other words, by magnifying the detail of the structure, we always find ever new detail. Therefore, it is called a structure with infinite number of details. Viewed from a mathematical standpoint, these structures originate through a definite series of transformations of the starting geometrical figure. However, the main characteristic is that the number of these transformations is fixed and limited and that the series of transformations is applied to every newly obtained figure. In that way, the most different geometrical shapes have been obtained, such as leaves of various plants, surface of mountain ranges, clouds, and other intricate curly, wrinkled, or strange chaotic structures not obtainable thus far. And now let's explore absolute relativity. A philosophical construct which can be relatively illustrated by circular or spherical infinity is the term absolute relativity, which basically means everything is relative to itself and interconnected. This may seem paradoxical, but regarding the seeming apparent contradiction between the absoluteness of all is relative, consider that the absolute can, in theory, only exist in the whole or monism only if everything within or relative to that whole is relative to everything else, which is also relative to that whole, therefore absolute relativity. An easier way to visualize or represent this could be a number of points all connected to each other, such as a 12 vertex complete graph. In this example, if you draw a 12-sided object and then connect each of the points to each of the other points with a straight line, that is your visual representation of absolute relativity. 
everything is relative to itself and interconnected. However, this can lead to a sort of fractal absolute relativity, in which simply by zooming in or out on the contained absolute relativity can result in nested absolute relativities, and can also be represented by enclosing a circle with a larger square which touches the circle's outsides, then enclosing the square with a larger circle touching the square's corners, and so on infinitely. The contradiction of absolute relativity appears and disappears relative to the extent at which the concept is understood. It works if you think about it and understand it. Such is the nature of nature to be and not be a paradox. One of the most fascinating things to note about this image of absolute relativity is that if you increase the number of vertices from 12 up to a hundred, to a thousand, up towards infinity, the shape will come closer and closer to becoming a perfect sphere. Perhaps a circle can be better described as a fractal. This is just a theory, but it's a fascinating one at that. Spheres, by definition, have an infinite number of tangent lines, which is exactly what we're representing with this graph of the vertices. Perhaps this is why decimal representations of pi never ends and never repeats. Pi is the mathematical constant that is the ratio of any circle's circumference to its diameter. Pi is an irrational number, which means that its value cannot be expressed exactly as a fraction, having integers on both the numerator and denominator. Consequently, its decimal representation never ends and never repeats. E is also a transcendental number, which implies, among other things, that no finite sequence of algebraic operations on integers, such as powers, roots, sums, etc., can render its value. Proving this fact was a significant mathematical achievement of the 19th century. Interestingly enough, pi is one of the most important natural irrational numbers in history. The Great Pyramid has embedded on its design an ancient approximation of pi, which they represented as 22 divided by 7. But the decimal that follows the 3 is close to pi, but not exact. While pi's first seven digits are 3.141592, 22 over 7 is 3.142857. We should note here that 142857 is a cyclic number, which means it repeats, so not an accurate representation of pi. Isn't that fascinating, don't you think, that spheres can be defined as fractals? I never even considered that before. I'm amazed! My mind has been blown, especially since in nature there is no such thing as a perfect sphere. Perhaps, in the world of mathematics, there is some sort of platonic form that represents a sphere, which is interesting because what we've been talking about all evening is the theory of chaos and the unpredictability of systems, which can be modeled by fractals. So, this all sounds crazy and a little bit confusing and hard to wrap your mind around, but... It is the most fascinating form of mathematics I've come across, and one that I hope to continue studying in the future. You know, because when I first started learning about mathematics, I found it all very dry and dull and repetitive and predictable. You know, you throw something up and it comes down in a trajectory that you can predict with an equation. But it's not as simple as that. It never was. Maybe overall the system is that easy to predict, but when you look up close at the irregularities that just arise seemingly out of nowhere, it's a little bit mind-boggling. Where do all of those random properties come from? Why is it that turbulence is created in the flow of fluids? Why is it that there are phenomena we simply cannot predict or explain? Nature always has a way of surprising us, 
and although we might not be able to fully understand it yet, perhaps we don't need to. I particularly like being surprised by the rare, beautiful, unpredictable gems that simply arise out of this strange reality that we live in. I think it's one of the most marvelously enticing fields that anybody could study. You know, who can decrypt the natural code of randomness first? I think that's where the beauty in life lies, especially if you're one that studies math. You tend to begin thinking that all things are predictable, the world is mechanical, but really it's not. It's this flowing system where everything is related to everything else, and every statistic is impacted by others. We live in a very highly interconnected universe. And out of it springs so much chaos. And I can't wait to explore all of it. And with that, it's time for me to say farewell. Thanks for listening to the Illumination Hour. If you have any comments or questions, please email me at illuminationhour at gmail.com. So long, everyone, and have a great night. See you next week. I said a long, long time ago In a galaxy far away Gather round my little comments I'm gonna tell you about the universe It's nebula Black hole Get your asteroid soup.